أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا والنبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on this, your show from the holy city of Karbala. Back to the basics in which we are discussing the concept of engaging in dialogue, disputation and indeed dispute with others who do not follow the same religion or belief system as ourselves or necessarily the same sect, so to speak. We have been discussing the conceptualization of a comprehensive framework a methodology by which we will be able to continue engaging with those who do not follow the same set of core beliefs as ourselves. And we've called this the concept of the world view, which is, of course, a interconnected set of beliefs which dictates how we think about ourselves, the nature of God in relation to ourselves, and, of course, our relationship with others in this universe. It, of course, will dictate every single way in which we view the world around us and how we ought to act. It doesn't necessarily dictate how we should act, but it dictates how we ought to act, or indeed, if there is even a way we ought to act. Of course, we've spent much time trying to demonstrate some particular specific aspects of this approach to religious discussions, but we were unable to, we were incapable of rather, producing the legwork or the groundwork required in order to really launch this model of ground. So tonight, inshallah ta'ala, that's what we hope to do. We hope to start off with the first big question, which is, of course, what is the nature of God and can we know anything about God? What is the nature of Allah, azawajal? Can we know anything about Allah? And how do we have confidence that there is such a concept known as Allah, azawajal? So, how do we engage with this question? Of course, in the past few episodes, we've been discussing one of the very key points, which is that instead of addressing individual soul questions like this and analyzing a specific detail of someone's worldview, we ought to look at the entire package. So, that's tonight what we're going to be doing in regards to the question of Allah's existence. How are we confident that we are, or should be rather, theists? When it comes to the existence of Allah Azawajal, the law of non-excluded middle states that there can only be two positions. There either is a God or there is not a God. And therefore, these are the only two options that lie in front of us. When it comes to the intellectually dishonest position of agnosticism, the position that I don't know and I'm going to say sitting on the fence, of course there are some that would go down that angle, but really, to the question as to whether or not Allah Azawajal, God, exists, there is only one of two answers, yes or no. We may be able to say that we don't know in terms of where we have reached a conclusion on, but it is certain that there's only two possibilities. God either exists or he does not exist. And therefore, we want to look at this question thoroughly and understand whether or not we can take atheism as a serious position when it comes to the discussion of worldviews. It is my claim, it is my personal position that atheism, alongside the Salafi school of theology, which we've already looked at in this series and shall continue to look at when we reach the section on Islamic theology, inshallah ta'ala, is the most absurd worldview that cannot be taken seriously due to the fact that again, to believe in it is literally the equivalent, if you understand the foundations of this worldview, of committing Russian roulette with all six bullets loaded within the gun. It's the intellectual equivalent of doing that. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean that atheism is the intellectual equivalent of playing Russian roulette with all six bullets loaded. Before we get fully into this topic, allow me to say the following, that when it comes to discussing all of these issues, all of these rational positions, all of these questions, these big questions which affect us and of course shape the very foundations of a worldview, we are engaging in something known as rationality or what the Western world knows as 
philosophy. Of course, when we say philosophy in an Islamic context, we're talking about something very different. And so I want to highlight right now that we are not talking about the philosophy, which is taught in some parts of the Muslim world. That is a completely different concern from the concern we have tonight. Our concern tonight is, of course, philosophy in the sense of rationality. Philosophy is, of course, something that every adult human being who is sane and functioning will eventually start thinking about as they reach a level of maturity. They would conceptualize the very experiences they have had in their childhoods, and these experiences would allow them to go on to think to themselves, why is it that this happened to me? Why is it that I have observed certain things in a particular way? And through observing all these different trends, experiences, and each situation leads to a new question in regards to, is this just probability, is this chance, and where do chance and probability even come from? These questions would lead to a person trying to develop a more comprehensive way of looking at life and a more comprehensive framework by which we could explain away our assumptions and engagement with reality. This is what we would call a worldview in relation to philosophy. We would try to come up with a view of life which unifies the varying experiences into a coherent outlook. And what philosophy would do, or rationality rather, what rationality would do is take those claims, take those assumptions, cross-examine them, and see are they really befitting of the experiences we've had in the world. I've given several examples over the past few nights. I don't want to get too deep into this particular topic. But what this rationality would ask is, what are the ultimate principles by which we answer philosophical questions about reality, knowledge, and morality? What are the principles, what are the factors which render our experiences intelligible or rational, rather? Are the principles consistent in and of themselves? Are they something that we can articulate within the framework of human language? And are they something that we can justify? Can we say that, yes, this seems something reasonable, or are they just arbitrary? Is that something, that is to say, do we just say, no, that this is how reality is, and reality is what it is? How should we understand nature? Is there a unity or an underlying series of laws which underpin nature? Or is it just a coherent bag of randomness? These are all questions that concern us when it comes to the issue of rationality. Now, one interesting thing about the history of human rationality is we can dictate how, uh, we can chart rather, how the atheist or godless movements have always viewed reality and how their very worldviews have led to absurdity and contradiction. Epicurus, who was born in the year 341 BC, was a materialistic atomist. He, like many materialists today, believed that the universe was comprised of physical atoms which swerve around in motion and cause the decisions we make today. He was essentially someone that was a hedonist when it came to morality, and he, felt, and he held that we essentially don't have free will. But the universe is composed of an infinite set of atoms. This particular philosopher, philosopher, of course, had a contradictory worldview, because if our thoughts were just atoms flowing in motion, then again, the question would need to be raised, why should we even trust our thoughts? Because if I have no control over my thoughts and there's no real objective process going on in understanding my brain, then what would be the point of trusting that very thought process? So this is where the proto-atheist philosophers began their thought process in regards to human knowledge and the human mind. Of course, as we progress, we see that they don't really get much stronger either. You have, of course, a very interesting Scottish philosopher. He's from my hometown, he's from Scotland, who is called David Hume. Now, David Hume, he shapes 
much of contemporary discourse in the philosophy of religion against beliefs in things such as miracles. And of course, he raised a very interesting problem in the philosophy of science, which we shall come to as well. This problem is known as the problem of induction. That is to say that the things we have experienced in the past, we can trust them in order to create laws or objective observations by which we can base facts. David Hume gave the classical example of, or sometimes this is used in satire rather, in comedy, the turkey which observes other turkeys every day about to, he notices that other turkeys every day are being snatched, but he's around daily. So based upon this, he creates the assumption that, well, tomorrow I'll still be around and another turkey is going to be taken. But of course, for that turkey, it would be a fallacious assumption because there might come the day where that particular turkey is taken and slaughtered. So David Hume had this particular problem when it came to the issue of induction. He stated that we can never use our past experiences to justify a law because our past experiences are limited and therefore we cannot derive a general ruling from them. To put it much simpler, the problem of induction according to David Hume is that we cannot take a limited sample of evidence and come up with a general principle from that limited sample because it would require us to have experienced the entirety of evidence. So because we haven't lived infinite lives, we could never use our past experiences to make an inference. More importantly, in order to even do induction, we would have to trust our memories and we would have to trust the process of induction itself. So David Hume argued that this was a very circular process. He utilizes a similar argument in his arguments against human miracles and the miracle claims of religion. He states that essentially, when it comes to miracles, we can never trust that they are accurate because these miracles are things which have been claimed by a small group of people and they're not common nor are they normal. His argument is essentially that we can never trust the testimony of those who witnessed the miracles because they're not great enough for us to put our trust into such phenomenon. But the problem with such a claim is that essentially what he's telling you is that we can never trust anything because David Hume doesn't trust induction in the first place. So David Hume's very arguments actually turn over onto their heads and end up becoming contradictions. And so what we find constantly when looking at these atheist thinkers is that their thoughts are generally built upon a series of contradictions. When we look at these contradictions, it's not surprising for us because you see, when you remove the existence of God out of the picture, you generally will fall into contradictory opinions. Dear viewers, we're going to go quickly for a break, but when we get back, we'll continue discussing this phenomenon, inshallah ta'ala. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us once more. Before the break, we were discussing the history of the development of atheist philosophy, and we went through Epicurus, and we went through to David Hume, and now we're reaching one of the favorite contemporary philosophers of the 20th century, a man that died in the 1970s after having a very long life, might I add, and someone revered in the history of 20th century philosophy. His name is, of course, Bertrand Russell, or He's known in some circles as Dirty Bertie, and I'm not going to go into the reasons for why he's known as that, but needless to say, a character of, dare I say, sketchy moral reasoning or 
a more sinister nature when it came to um, more unsavory character when it came to his choices in morality. Bertrand Russell again came up with several methods of how to obtain knowledge. But again, one thing that people find is that all such attempts were largely incoherent. He based his assumptions upon the fact that we can trust scientific facts and again mathematical facts. But when it came to his evidence for these scientific and mathematical facts, he fully concedes that these are just principles he adopts, again presuppositions, without any valid evidence. And so what you find is that when it comes to these atheist skeptics, they might talk a good game about the need for us to bring evidence, but then they don't even have a coherent definition of what that canon of evidence they will bring us is even going to be. They're unable to tell us what they expect as evidence. So when they tell you, for example, that they want proof for the existence of God, they're not able to tell you what one should expect as proof for the existence of God because you see, when it comes to this great game they play, they'll start saying that we can't be certain of anything. And if I can't be certain of anything, then nothing is established. And if nothing is established, it's gonna be very hard for me to have a conversation about anything. And Bertrand Russell, who died in 1970, fell into this problem as well. And then we get to the last of the atheist thinkers we want to look at today in this brief history of pre-21st century atheism, who is called Ludwig Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein was a student of Bertrand Russell. Now his argument was that essentially the problem that exists within human thought is the problem of human language. He claimed that essentially we have created a language which is dependent upon superstition, things like a human dependence upon metaphysics, that is to say, a belief in that which is beyond the physical world and a belief in assumptions which are not. They lack meaning objectively. So he would say, for example, Ludwig Wittgenstein would not only say that I don't believe a God exists, he would actually take that statement that God exists and say, I have no clue what that means. It's a meaningless term. According to language, it's literally something that should be removed from the dictionary because I can't even conceive of what that even means. This was the train of thought used by Ludwig Wittgenstein. He states, most of the propositions and questions to be found in philosophical works are not false, but nonsensical. Consequently, we cannot give any answer to questions of this kind, but can only point out that they are nonsensical. Most of the propositions and questions of philosophers arise from our failure to understand the logic of our language. So what Ludwig Wittgenstein proposed is that we purge human language from these irrelevant concepts. And what he proposed was that our language should only encompass those things which are rational and scientific facts. But there's a big problem with that, you see, because if that is how we want to address human language, and we apply Qa'idat al-Ilzam on the theory of Ludwig Wittgenstein, we would see that if a burglar comes to my house and he steals from me, and I go to the police station and I try to have that conversation with a policeman, according to the world of Ludwig Wittgenstein, there's not much I could say. I could say that, you see, a burglar broke into the lock on my house and he might say, well, these are meaningless statements because they're, they're not statements that I could demonstrate or prove at that time. I don't have CCTV, these are not statements of scientific fact. And so that whole conversation would be something which is a problem. Now, that wasn't where Ludwig Wittgenstein's original downfall came. His original downfall came because he initially recognized a bigger problem, which was that in his claim that language is meaningless and much of these terms hold no meaning, he wrote his original book in the English language 
and in languages which utilized the very terms and language and logic that he was criticizing. So many of his contemporaries came out and said that, well, if this is meaningless, then essentially you've just refuted yourself by writing a book within this language. So in order to try and counteract that, Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote a rejoinder in which he stated that he was merely using outdated language as a series of steps or like a ladder that we as human beings might try to ascend the problems of our previous thinking. But once we reach the heights, we would take that language like a ladder and throw it away. So we see that this is the history of the promising, very promising developments of early pre-modern atheist philosophy. Now, the question is, why did they fall into absurdity? Is it not easy to say that anyone could really fall into absurdity? And more importantly, isn't atheism just a lack of belief in God? Isn't it fair to just say that an atheist is merely someone that does not believe in God, but when it comes to a philosophical position, when it comes to assumptions about ethics, when it comes to anything else, they're not really bound to any particular school. And they could be an atheist but believe that ethics exist, or they could be an atheist and they could have certain political leanings, but another atheist might have different political leanings. And they could be an atheist, but that atheism is merely the absence of belief in a god and affects nothing else. Well, you see, that's not the case. As we stated, everything is shaped by the bigger questions we believe. So if you believe that there is no God, that statement itself, that belief itself will have consequences. And those consequences will play out in pretty much every specific field. We're going to witness that in the next few episodes, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to witness how that plays out in ethics. We're going to witness how that plays out when it comes to knowledge. We're going to witness how that plays out in the most basic of human areas of inquiry. So don't allow someone to tell you that this is merely my reflection as someone that doesn't believe in God in the same way that your belief in your non-belief in Santa Claus doesn't affect the way you act as well. Listen, there's a big difference between not believing in Santa Claus and not believing in God. And, and this is really a ridiculous claim from the atheist side, but we shall come to see that this is not merely an admission by believing philosophers who wish to tarnish the atheist side, but by atheist philosophers as well. They admit these things in their books and it's something they very commonly say. But dear viewers, we're going to have to leave that all for another night. I thank you so much for joining me tonight on Back to the Basics and inshallah ta'ala we can continue this conversation tomorrow. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.